Hello, so welcome to another edition of Featured Business, brought to you by your guests, James Moffat, myself, and Visibility Impact. Today we have our 87th guest, all the way from Australia, I'm not sure where you are, uh, Nicola Gibson, all right? Nicola, is it Nicola or Nick or? Nicole, or Nick is fine, yeah. Oh, Nicole, I'm saying the name wrong already. Nicole Gibson, good right? Order. Right. So you are our 87th guest, so welcome. And we're going to kick this up. Sorry? What an honour. Same to you. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, And so we're going to kick this off with a song from Emily, who sings every week, or most weeks, or she gives us a recording, or the kids sing. Yeah. Sometimes. Right. Pressure. Right. So today, you're going to sing. No, I'll let you introduce yourself and then we'll get going. Okay. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm a music teacher here in Lausanne and Mm. I organise kids events. So I will sing. I will sing the, well, it's requested by James, actually, the Bob Marley song. (laughs) Let me just move the laptop because... Not really in a great place. It's about to turn off, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, don't know how I, long it's going to last. Yeah, I do have your recording, so I was going to play that if you couldn't turn up. <laughs> That's how I found it, the song, because I was looking at your YouTube uh, show. Okay, it might turn off, but let's hope it doesn't. Uh, it has okay. Very low battery. Well, that was the same excuse last week. Oh, that was my phone battery. This is my laptop battery. Uh, well, get plug it in, get a charger. Yeah, okay, let me plug it in. All right, one second. Right. Yeah, we don't want to lose you halfway through a song. <laughs> so I guess you're home. Yeah. Good, hol- good holiday? Yeah, it was really nice. It was really nice. It was Sardinia. Really pretty there. Good choice. Sardinia is great. Yeah, it's really pretty. Very nice. Blue zone. Sorry? It's a blue zone. People live very, very long lives in Sardinia. I think oh. it, they've, they've got something right. Well, I guess the water, the food. Hmm. Yeah, I know about these blue yeah, zones. The <laughs> There's some in Jap- uh, South Island of Japan as well. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, over to you, Emily. Okay. Okay.
chords in there but yeah yeah well you did good very good it, it was good right so emily you have to drop off or you can hang around or unfortunately i really have to go sorry okay all right thank well, th you thank you very much emily all and right and see you next week yeah I, i'm you, sorry you can thank send you. me the link the recording so i can listen to the speaker after I, I i will i'll send you the link and i'll i'll send you maybe some advanced warning of the type of song before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, thanks, Emily. Have a great right. weekend. Thanks, you too. Bye. 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 Right. Boy, I just let you introduce Sorry yourself. Being late. No problem. I just let you introduce yourself yeah. quick and then we'll get going. Yes, I'm Boyan from Bulgaria. I'm uh, really addicted to the show that uh, these meetups every week that James is organizing, meeting great people, connecting, learning uh, valuable life stories and journeys and always learn from uh, something. So it's it's amazing. Um, I'm like an advocate for, <laughs> for this. <laughs> but Boyan was one, yeah, he was one of the early guests. And then since then, he's pretty much watched every one of them. And oh, so... Wow. Uh, so he is kind of the, he gets the award for being the, the, yeah, the most kind of the best follower. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you, I, I, you, I think, you know, in the past, they introduced the 26th uh, shot in, in the movies. So maybe James is using something that <laughs> you know, like, you cannot live without joining this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The Community Spirit Award. That's, that's what it is. It could be, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay, so let's get going then. So, Nicole, we're going to go through your story. So before we get up to what you're doing now, which is very interesting, we're going to take you back through memory lane and from childhood. I just want to understand a bit more about your childhood and some any turning points or memorable experiences that you want to share, and then we'll get up to the current day. So I'm kind of going to steer that. So just for the audience, tell us where you are now, because I know you're you between three different countries. So where where are you living, and is that the place of birth? Um, currently, I'm in Sydney, Australia. No, this was not my city of birth, but Australia was my country of birth. Um, but I grew up between the UK and Australia um, and definitely feel like I relate to both of them as home in very different ways, but probably equally as such. Excellent. And you're, you spend more time abroad or, or back in Australia? It's really been so, I think, you know, going back to my childhood, that was definitely, uh, it set a precedent of um, how long I can stay in any one place, which is not very long, historically speaking. Actually, COVID was the longest I'd ever spent in a single location during my whole adult life, which was um, 11 months. I stayed in one place. Wow. And that was the, yeah, the, the longest I had ever stayed in one place since I was 17. Um, but growing up, 
I went to 10 different schools and de definitely a lot of change all the time. And so I think that that definitely gives me like a bit of itchy feet syndrome. Also makes me qualified to talk about change and teach change. So I feel like that was a nice kind of PhD in what I have then gone on to, <laughs> to do with my, my journey and my career as an adult. Well, that's kind of the best way to learn is from personal experience. And so why, why so many different schools then? Um, I would like to say that I was, I was so misbehaved and rebellious that I was expelled from every single one because that would make me seem like um, much more of a badass. But I'm sure that may have been true in, in a couple of instances, but not all of them. I had a family that, that loved change and um, my dad had a, a pretty alternative career as a professional gambler. And, um, Interesting that, job. A very interesting job. Yeah, he's a um, he's he's definitely a mathematical genius, um, and all of it was very uh, calculated and down to his ability to understand uh, statistics, basically and probability. Um, so that so, took us around the world as a family. But was he <laughs> was he successful, or were you changing because he had to escape? <laughs> no, there was there was no escape. There was no escaping. Um, Although I, th I think he definitely got, his name got barred from, <laughs> I would say, a few venues around the world. But no, the, the change was, um, yeah, business opportunities and... Um, Dif different casinos. Yeah, yeah sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but um, well, he, he had a deep love for horse racing as well. And then um, uh, eventually worked um, establishing kind of the, the uprising of online betting too. So in, in a way, very different to the, the path that I've chosen to pursue with my life. But sometimes I look at the way his mind is and how he solves problems. And I definitely see the, the similarity there. But did you, you have siblings? Two older brothers, yeah, much older than me. All right. So, he, I mean, it's the same for them. I mean, start a new school one after the other. It actually had more of an effect on me because um, a lot of the travel started when I was uh, quite young, like five-ish. Um, and my brothers at that point, Daniel, who's the middle brother, he was already 13 and, and Matthew was 16. So, you know, that they had that kind of change in the, the later years um, of growing up with mum and dad, but I had that change pretty much consistently through my young years all the way through my adolescence. And being a, a big gap between you and, and a girl as well, so you kind of sometimes feel isolated, I guess. Yeah, I think... Um, or oh, you're isolated then. <laughs> What's that? Or oh, you're isolated then. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. That's, that's sort of what I was going to allude to. I think that I definitely a, a challenge that they probably weren't overly prepared for. I think I was probably a bit of a surprise too when I just think about it chronologically. <laughs> right, so, I hope in the best possible way. Right, so this, I mean, changing school, I, I know I changed a few times as well, but uh, I mean, not so many as you, uh, but that definitely affected my education, particularly when it comes to different types of school because I, there were some subjects I was taking and then they weren't available in the next school. So how did that affect the schooling? So by 14, I actually made the decision to leave mainstream school to go to a performance academy. Um, my love at that age was theatre and I guess in many ways it still is. Um, I loved performance so much. And the performance school that I got accepted into did the International Baccalaureate so it was kind of a new, uh, that was in Australia and all, you know, my education in the UK and, and, and Australia hadn't been following an IB curriculum. So I kind of oh, had this. Sorry to this is where, where the kangaroos are, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's Australia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just have them everywhere. You walk outside and they're just, you know, yeah, skipping all over the place. <laughs> no, it's, it's not really like that. Not in the cities. Um, yeah, so I kind of had this opportunity, I, I guess, to kind of start again in, in terms of the focus of my subjects. And 
I majored in theatre and the academy I went to uh, gave us the ability to focus predominantly on our art and then we got to do our, our other subjects kind of as a secondary aspect of, of that study which worked really really well for me um but yeah I think honestly like I never really understood school <laughs> I never really understood why we had to sit in a classroom for eight hours a day and all wear the same uniform and so I always had a lot of questions I felt were never properly answered and that very easy yeah. answer so your mm -hmm. parents will be able to work um they take care no, of no one no one was able to give a good answer on no. I, I was it was not convinced it was so unconvincing that I decided to leave school at 14 and, and do my own thing so that's about how convincing it was for me yeah I, I know how you feel because I mean I I thought it was kind of I mean I was always called I mean in my school report the teachers would write James could do so much more if he concentrated and he wasn't daydreaming and yeah. I thought I had more fun daydreaming, right? Yeah. I, at least it, I'd be in a place that I wanted to be. Yeah. And in the class, it wasn't necessarily the place. But it was also down to the, the, the teachers who kind of delivered the, the I say, program, uh, the, the lesson. Because if they were boring and monotone, and it doesn't matter how good the subject was, there's just a, the, the delivery of the, the teacher was terrible. So, mm -hmm. you, and then you can have a great, uh, a boring subject made good by the teacher so there, there was so much that kind of didn't work and but I still see it today I, I have three kids I mean nine and is my eldest son and twins a boy and a girl who are six and I've seen it all exactly the same nothing has changed so no. it, it's kind of time to change and I, I think Deborah has just dropped off and uh, she would agree with that as well I mean there's so much that we need to do, particularly with education, to make it fun. But I always question, I mean, the kids are out at school and then, then they come home with a ton of homework. Yeah. And, what are they doing? And I think, and, <laughs> yeah, you, you've already yeah. kind of brain numbed them at school and then you've given the, the parents some work to do with the kids now. And I think I've got enough to do. Yeah. No, I know. I agree. I, I definitely don't think that our current education system is um, conducive at all to preparing young people for the world that they're stepping into. Um, a lot of thoughts on that. You know, I think our education system was created when kids needed to be trained for sort of in batches for industries that won't even require a sort of human workforce in the next several decades. <laughs> so I think disruption is actually inevitable. That's a good thing in, in that space. And it's it's just down to how and when. But I think it's definitely, it, we will see that in the next 10 years, I think. Yeah. I think I read somewhere, it was kind of Henry T. Ford uh, wanted a workforce to work in factories to build cars. So you had to educate them so they followed orders. And That's right. And it's kind of like that, you're preconditioning people. So when they leave school, you can put them straight into factories and work for you. Yeah. If you educate them too much, they won't, don't want to work in factories. That's right. So effectively, this dumb was them down. the education system. During the communism, it was different message. You exit mm. school and you continue to follow the party rules. <laughs> Not only work, but for everything you like. So it was different educational systems uh, to speak about to because i i studied the basic schools in doing the socialism totally mm. different then you join but you on the focus i i will not <laughs> take your time how, how was that for you boy and how did uh i was as, uh, as, as a young person learning that did you feel that that was the like the wrong thing or the right thing I think it was maybe also maybe thinking also the right I was uh, always the best uh, guy in school with top marks with top knowledge with etc. Then uh, you, but from another side my father and mother uh, out of the school uh, we were learning a lot a lot of practical things that they are totally not taught in school so. Uh, not that, uh, let's say, blaming the school, but uh, to, to do like work, to survive, let's say, how to survive in forest or a lot of things that uh, 
the school is not preparing you for life or to address like new stuff to mm. but then it changed then uh, even this system was producing good let's say education scientists then over the capitalism it ruined so now we are on the cure of the educational systems compared let's say universities etc but anyway this is kind of history you you're on the focus <laughs> we can make a video too. or you can watch what i uh, yeah. <laughs> i will thank you <laughs> yeah so education i mean we'll kind of move on from that so when you finally left school i mean did you have an idea of what you wanted to do I think that was that was really defined by my later experiences through my time at the academy. So, as we were talking about before, I developed a, um, <clears throat> what became a very life threatening eating disorder, and so that was during my final years of um, what would have been the equivalent of high school. And uh, up until that point, I was adamant that I was going to perform, but because my health was so compromised. Um, the doctors that I was working with at the time, a lot of the theatre training I was doing was um, a specific discipline of theatre that was similar to physical theatre. So it was very active um, and it exerted a lot of energy and I just didn't have the physical stamina because of my health to um, to sustain that. So that was so sort of... This was more physical health or mental health or a combination? Well, it it's mental health but it i think uh anorexia is a little bit unique in in the way that it is a mental health problem that has such a physical impact mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. um being so underweight so at what age what age did you i mean that start it, it can be hard to pinpoint um i would say the beginnings of of that probably began, you know, years before it was diagnosed. So it was diagnosed at 16. And I would say I probably had signs of it maybe at 12 or 13. Yeah. Do you, do you think this was, I mean, do you know what it was attributed to? I mean, was it kind of the constant moving, uh, maybe life at home or surroundings or not fitting in or, or anything in particular? Yeah, I, I, I could sort of speculate. I think like um, any kind of significant manifestation of mental health complications is probably a combination of a lot of things, I would mm -hmm. say, uh, rather than just one, one thing. Um, I think anorexia in particular is very linked to needing to feel in control. You know, when you don't feel in control of your world, then you come back to the one thing that you can control, which is what you're putting into your body. And I think that that definitely felt true for me at, at, the, at that time. It gave me a sense of um, feeling safe and feeling okay. And it's a very, very, very difficult thing to treat because unlike someone who has, you know, uh, even, you know, something like, cancer or even depression generally patients want to get better but the, comp the complex thing about an eating disorder is um when you're in that mindset you you don't actually want to recover and so you're sort of working against your practitioners in a lot of ways and so the final couple of years of my high school equivalent was very consumed by recovery that was sort of like a full-time focus was me trying to rehabilitate my, my mind and, and my body. But ultimately I'm very grateful for that experience because it, it did set me on a different path. I think I definitely would have continued to pursue performance, but because I went through that, it unlocked a, a deeper understanding of um, the complexities of our world and our society and the pressures that are put on us, um, especially for those that are sensitive to that and the effect that it can have you know it, that that illness could have potentially taken my life at such a young age and I think that that gave me a really unique perspective um that even in you know the work I've done since working with people twice three times 
sometimes even four times my age, I found that perspective to be quite rare which is really this deep understanding that life is not forever that we are going to to die at some point and um if you invest you know in in things that don't ultimately fulfill you then we're losing these kind of precious fragile moments that we've been that we've been given no absolutely so i mean that the you had a kind of a road to recovery so you've recovered now from that and that's kind of in the past or that still lingers with you at times? The eating disorder, no, but I think um, part of how I rehabilitated from that sort of, I guess, frame of mind was really understanding that that was a manifestation of something much deeper within me. And I think the tendencies, I guess, um, the aspects of my personality that, were susceptible to going through something like that. I like uh, a really strong desire for things I focus on and, and put my energy into to be at a point of sort of almost unachievable excellence. So I guess perfectionism um, to, to really have a, a tendency to, to put so much of myself into what I am focusing on and what I create. And a lot of my therapists, when I went through that recovery journey, were very much trying to, in a way, discourage me from um, owning those parts of my personality. But actually, I found a lot more healing and understanding that that is a fundamental part of me. And I, I believe, I believed and still believe that my quality of life will actually be improved more so rather than trying to change it, trying to apply it in, in a way that actually, you know, fulfills me and can provide something useful and powerful for the world. Um, and that really did become, you know, as much as I was in the health system and that, that was sort of an aspect to my recovery, my true healing and my true recovery, I believe, uh, started when I left school and I started um, my first enterprise which was a non-profit a uh, mental health charity and I really started to use my gifts to help other people that's when I really started to heal myself so do you have early photos of yourself as a reminder of what you were like um there's a, there's a few photos that I have yeah at the time I really I hated photos being taken of me so that there aren't that many there's you know maybe two or three and yeah well, when I when I look at them it's it's um I think it it's so interesting to kind of see it. I guess we all feel this in a way, you know, from younger versions of ourselves through through the perspective I have now and how I know myself. And um especially being in that world, I had a lot of positive reinforcement of very toxic behaviors because that was very signature, you know, to a to a performer. Um a young female performer those pressures were often applied to you to look a certain way and be a certain way and um I look at those photos and I see the deep sadness and and how lost I was in myself spiritually but that was not sort of noticed by anyone around me at, at that time that really became a journey that I had to I had to find so you know I had to find that path so if you I mean they, they would have got to a point that if you continued in the same direction, then you could basically starve yourself to death, right? Uh, or you seek medical or professional help and mm. you, you kind of change that around. And so kind of what point did it get that, I mean, did you have family that were pushing you that you've got to do something, come on, you've got to eat these this food or you've got to kind of pushing you into doing something rather than trying to understand why Mm. And uh, at kind of what point was kind of that pivot point that you decided, did you decide for yourself or was it an influence from someone else or something you read or how did that change? Yeah, it's a great question. So to, to answer the first part of that question, family and, and those close to me definitely, uh, like, of course, you know, it's, it's instinct if you see someone you love that, is starving themselves you want them to eat and the focus can by default be the food but really it's not about the food at all 
Um, but because that was such a point of focus, it, it was really hard because, you know, it's, it's like telling someone with, with a broken leg, just go for a run. It's really easy, you know, like just eat, it's really easy, but um, it, it's not, you know, and I think anyone that's gone through mental health challenges, even, you know, anxiety and depression, just telling someone don't have an anxiety attack or get out of bed, don't be depressed. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not so simple. Um, yeah. And I, I have a lot of, you know, forgiveness and compassion for how, those around me at the time you know that that was the best they knew that that's the best you know they had to basically try and support me but actually it was um it was my school principal that really was the one to have the vulnerable conversation with me that that I think changed my life and mm -hmm. sent me on a different path and you know in in so many ways uh was the reason that I wanted to pursue a path of leadership rather than just artistry and performance because um, of the way that it touched my life. So, you know, this middle-aged alpha male, you know, being brave enough, and I really do see it as that, brave enough to have a very vulnerable conversation with me as a 16-year-old girl about um, the fact he could see my suffering was... I think probably the turning point, to be honest. So, so the school principal, I mean, was the, this person recommended that, oh yeah, we have a, a child in the school that's got a problem or did mm. the principal see this and call you over and say, look, we need to talk or how did that yeah, happen? Yeah, he, he noticed. I saw, I, I, I would notice him sort of noticing me for the months leading up to that and when so there was sort of a, a period in the eating disorder where it was kind of gradual weight loss and then I, I took a quite a bad turn and I lost a significant amount of weight in a very short period of time and that's when people around me really started to sort of react in in very sort of strange ways because they didn't know how to handle it um, and so on one hand I was experiencing a lot of people kind of rejecting me or not knowing how to communicate with me um but then what what he did was was essentially the opposite thing he came up to me um and asked specifically if he could have a conversation with me in in his office um which I was so not expecting you know of, of all people I didn't really have a, a sort of a personal relationship with him or um but he, he actually later told me that he had had a previous student that he didn't, inter, he didn't interfere, uh, who also had an eating disorder and she ended up having a, a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. And he, he promised himself that he would sort of never let that happen again. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for, for him and his presence in my life. I think he was, he was an angel for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It, it makes me think of, I don't know if you remember the, the movie Good Will Hunting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also about gaining the trust of the other person. Mm. I mean, someone is there offering help, but you don't know that person. You, you don't trust them at the moment or, or mm. there's kind of some reservation there and you've mm. got to kind of gain that trust and, and then you can start opening up and, and sharing kind of problems. But a lot of the time, we don't know how to share. Yeah. It's about the person asking the right questions. That's right. Once you ask the right questions, then you open up and you get the answers. But a lot of people don't ask the questions. They prescribe something that they think is right. Yeah, that's true, so, right. That's, that, that's so right. I've seen that so much in my work. In mental health, it's people becoming so consumed by the self-talk if there's someone in their life that's suffering they'll start thinking well what if I say the wrong thing what if I do the wrong thing what if I am not the right you know person and what people don't realize is if that's what is going through your mind when there's someone in your life that really needs you you're making it all about yourself mm -hmm. what if I say the wrong thing what if I do the wrong thing and if we simply just shift our focus and be present you know with the person in front of us um, and start 
asking them, you know, what, what, what do you need to feel supported and how can I better hear what you're, you know, understand what you're going through. It doesn't matter if you don't have the perfect words, people will feel and receive that, you know, love. Yeah, and I think you don't need to be a especially qualified person in a way that you've got this academical background in psychology or whatever it may be. Okay. You just need someone that is an active listener and mm -hmm. can ask questions and, and kind of reassure you that everything's going to be okay. And, yeah. and then it's building up these relationships. Too many people mm -hmm. also, I mean, if you come into a, a discussion and you say, look, I, I don't know if I have all the answers, but I am prepared to talk and then try to understand. Then mm. not someone like going in there thinking that they know it all, kind of the ego talking and thinking they can fix all the problems. Maybe, maybe yeah. they can't. But I mean, they're doing it in this way. I mean, obviously that, that was a kind of a guardian angel and the person that change the way that you think that then you went on to so then leaving school you, you talked about did, did you pursue the arts or did you go straight into kind of the mental health area so I, I started you know within months of leaving um or graduating from the academy starting the foundation and starting to work with people having mm -hmm. said that it was very inspired by performance so the way that I would facilitate the art that I was trained in in theatre was called um, Meisner, which was, is quite a unique sort of modality of performance. Basically, the, the theory behind the performance is being 100% yourself under the given circumstances. So what it asks of you is basically who would you be under these circumstances? And so the training, I didn't realise it at the time, but I started to realise it as I sort of grew up that, all of the training was very spiritual training because you basically had to challenge your ego consistently because if you were given a set of circumstances that you wanted to de-identify with, which is very human, you know, if you're cast as like a thief or a cheat or whatever, you don't, you don't want to see that in yourself. But this specific type of art basically asks that of you, like who would you as you be? But did you and how would you act? Did you pick that type of art or was that kind of what was on offer? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I, I really, I was drawn to it. So obviously this was always in me. But, but uh, that, just, that, that is a different typical art that you get taught at, at regular school, isn't it? I mean, that seems something. Well, I, 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 it was a specialist academy. So yeah, All right, I went, okay. yeah, so a, a proper academy for performance and that, that became my, my major. But right. when I started doing the work, with people and sharing stories and, and holding space and facilitating those skills that I learned around, you know, don't let your ego get in the way and, and mm -hmm. really like see yourself in, in others. That became like, I guess, the driving force behind a lot of my facilitation work. Because I, I, I know, I mean, born into a duality, we struggle with ego every day. Sure. And yeah, sometimes it gets the better of you and other times you see it in, in mm -hmm. what you've said or you've done and then yep. you can kind of control it but understanding it, it mm -hmm. is the important thing otherwise ego just plays its role and it controls your life yeah so That's right. but doing that also kind of geared you up for something that would come later with more like the public speaking yeah for sure it, it was all a very beautiful um, initiation, I think, you know, even, even the depths of, of the suffering. Going through something like anorexia, it can be a very difficult thing to try and sort of put words to, but it's, it's a self-induced suffering every day. Like it's, it's self-starvation. And so through that, so beginning to work with people, my, my depth of understanding and compassion for people's pain was very, very deep. And I think it, it allowed me to connect with people both, you know, as a speaker, but also more intimately as a facilitator on a level that became my superpower and really drove the work that I went on to do in the world. Um, and I, I wouldn't change any of it, you know, that those years were very, very difficult years. And in a lot of ways, it felt like I was living in a sort of self-induced prison, but 
on the other side of that, I, I know what true freedom feels like and true liberation. So you can't have one without the other, as you say, like it's a dualistic world. And I think I had to journey the depth of feeling trapped to, to really understand what it means to be free. Uh, anyway, I, I know that there's tons and tons and tons of things to talk about. We, we need to kind of fast forward to kind of what you're yeah. doing now. But in saying that, I mean, you're looking very radiant and healthy. I know it's late at night where you are now, <laughs> right? Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, you're looking great. So, and I guess your health and everything is fine now. It was a long road, but yeah, now, you know, it's, it's definitely completely in the past. Um, but healing was... Uh, I think this is important for people to understand. Maybe there's a listener that's going through some sort of health challenge, you know, or something like this. It didn't happen like that. It was, it was consistency and commitment and belief. And a lot of the time it was belief in something beyond what the medical system said was possible. So I was told, for instance, that I wouldn't be allowed to have children. And I reversed that you know, and that if I had listened to um, the doctors, then I, I never would have tried, I never would have believed, I never would have strived to get my health to a point where, you know, if, if I was to do an assessment now, there would be no um, sort of residue of, of the fact that I went through something so severe, so young. Uh, but I had to believe in something beyond what was being presented to me through through the health system and i believe everyone has the ability to heal themselves i really do absolutely and you, you mentioned children you'd like children absolutely yeah definitely yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. i have three you can always come and babysit <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> yeah. <laughs> so i mean children are, are magical and particularly you'll it opens up a whole new chapter and particularly when you do bedtime storytelling and all the other things <laughs> with them, that, but, but we can digress a lot on that. So, <laughs> so let's just, if you could just fast forward, I mean, just go through kind of the things that you've done and then we'll get up to kind of the current day stuff. Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's, um, it's important context because running a tech company now, it's sort of, when you look at it from um, a more superficial standpoint, my journey definitely didn't seem like it would take me in that direction because the work I had begun doing um, post graduating was, was very much about being with communities, being with people. So I started a foundation um, and the initial premise of that foundation was to create spaces in communities and specifically schools for people to share their story. So a lot of synergy, James, in, in what you believe. Um, and really seeing like the, the healing potential that comes with sharing your story. That foundation grew into uh, more of a community consultation um, model where basically consultants would come into communities and, and engage the entire community and look at how the community could come together and build what we we called emotional infrastructure so not just looking at physical infrastructure but emotional infrastructure um and that that grew in this really beautiful way i ended up uh being asked by the federal government in australia to become a, a federal health commissioner because a lot of the community solutions that we'd created were so um, cost effective for government to implement because the results were so amazing, but the, the cost of you know, love and kindness is, is a lot less than the other things they were investing in. Um, so that was an interesting chapter. I spent four years in, in that really senior position in, in government um, and sort of other things that I did during that time, but they were kind of the, the high notes of it. I recognize that I, I liked changing things on a, a top policy level and I loved changing things on a community level, but I also really saw through the contrast of those two pursuits, the disconnection. And I really understood that we can change all the policy in the world, but if people's hearts don't change, then nothing changes. And I became really inspired by understanding that love really is the answer. And I wanted to find like who are the people in the world that are really teaching this, like te truly teaching people how to love and how to make decisions from a place of love. And to be honest, I, I didn't even get close to finding 
you know, an organization or leaders that I felt did that to an adequate standard, the closest I got were, you know, the, the idols like mystics and mystic poets and, you know, Jesus, as we were talking about before, as, as the master storyteller, like these were the stories that sort of touched on trying to be relevant in, in a modern day context, but still I felt that there was something missing that, that I could serve and that that's what sort of catalyzed the creation of Love Out Loud. Yeah, I mean, I, I've looked at that. So you, you're doing kind of parallel things, but you also did kind of a road trip around Australia uh, on mental health yeah. and many yeah, other things. Uh, yeah. Okay, just, just fill in kind of some gaps there because there's some fantastic stories. I know we haven't got time to go into them in great detail, but enough mm -hmm. to kind of whet the audience's appetite so they can reach out and connect to you. And anyone that is maybe feeling similar to you as you were with a, a child suffering with anorexia, that maybe they can also connect with you and uh, we'll, we'll share the links later and, and then people can reach out. But I mean, just, just share a few more about kind of what you did across Australia and also you had a Mind Valley experience. For people that don't know who Mind Valley is, maybe let us know what that is. And, and then we'll get back to date with exactly what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, there's so many stories, James, <laughs> through, through this time, but the road trip that you're referring to. So when I first started the foundation, I was really aware, you know, that my my concept of how we solve this um, crisis that I felt we were facing of disconnection as humanity was, um, I, I knew that it was quite a different way of thinking and I, I didn't want to I didn't want to say this is the answer I wanted to see if other people felt the same way I felt. And so as an 18 year old, um, my initial kind of thought and mission was to go and travel to communities and, and create spaces where people could share their story. And my main objective was to listen. And it was this incredible experience that started with, you know, maybe three or four people turning up to a, a workshop um, and then eventually that, that started to grow to 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, and then eventually, you know, audiences of 1,000. And this was over um, a two-year period. It just kind of had this momentum that became a, a bit of an unstoppable force. Um, but what amazed me so much about that experience, and I think it really gave me the belief to continue the path, was when people came together together, with with pure intention um and love and they shared the truth that was inside of them they'd been too afraid to share people were experiencing very amazing miraculous healings of you know really long-term health complications you know psychiatric problems that they had tried to have treatment for for decades were were shifting in these spaces in in very rapid um amounts of time and it made me realize wow love is it's not just like a a nicety it's it has a healing property that is just missing you know from our world and specifically our health systems and our education systems and often our workplaces um and that was through listening that i really started to understand this that we don't have to do anything it's not about the right words it's not about you know these sort of fancy medical interventions they have a role, but I think um, we really underestimate simply just giving people presence and love the the true healing effect that has. No, absolutely, and kind of that's why I I do this show. But I mean, I also work with with schools and children on sharing stories because yeah. it's through stories that people open up, and it's not necessarily about me telling my story. I want to hear their stories. And then, yeah. then you can ask them questions. And it's the questions that are the kind of the key to everything. Mm. Because you can ask them, how did that feel? Yeah. Elaborate a bit more on that story. When did it start? And yeah. I mean, lots of questions. And then you're you're helping them extract the answers from themselves. And all you're doing is listening and asking right. the, the right questions. It's kind of like a doctor-patient analogy thing yeah. and allowing them to talk. And yeah. 
the, the, the beauty of that is it's a learning, a massive learning at the same time. I mean, I know we could digress here, but I mean, I, 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 did, I, I did a lot of that when you're kind of soul seeking and trying to find yourself. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to go into my stories, but I mean, uh, a lot of the time we ask these questions, we want to know, but we, d we don't know how. And it, you can't always find the people right. that understand enough about just listening and asking questions. Yeah. And the, the, the beauty of that is everybody has unique stories to tell and things can be solved through storytelling. Yeah. So, so, so how did you get the, the, the name of the business is, is what? I mean, you've got how many businesses do you have running at the moment? <laughs> um, it, it's just the one. So um, as Love Out Loud grew and we started to develop tech, um, we now have a, the parent company, which is called In Truth Technologies. But Love Out Loud's a, a part of that that company that is more so focused on events. Um, but it's kind of all one company that's umbrellaed now by In Truth. Okay, and tell us a bit more about that. Is that relatively new? Yeah, it's it's definitely been an evolution. So as Love Out Loud grew, which was the company I started after working with with the government um started as a book that i wrote and then grew into okay so, so the, the book i mean you what's the book it's called the same name love out loud love out loud yeah you've got it yeah so i i don't i don't i don't have a copy with me no but you can uh, I, you have to send me because i i collect i collect my guests books ah, I, yeah, just, I just, really just on that there's i've got another australian guest i don't know if you'll know him right but but this is a guy yeah. Oh, cool. I don't know. Yeah. Well, he's based in Sydney, but I mean, he he, he was a uh, he was a guest and a, a great guy. You should connect, actually. Where are you based in Australia? Sydney. Oh yeah. So he's probably yeah. somewhere in the region. Yeah. So yeah. definitely, definitely worth connecting. So I'll send it's him the recording. Next door neighbor, maybe. Probably, yeah. <laughs> but I, a lot of these people. I mean, it's exactly what you're saying. Everything is coming now from the heart and extracting kind of the, the emotions and kind of what, what does it all mean? So kind of but before you get there, you've kind of got to ground yourself. And yeah. I mean, if you understand anything about the chakras and then knowing how to use them and then how to, then everything like comes from the heart and yeah. be more heart centered. So mm -hmm. everything that we do is is for the higher purpose and and not for our ego. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so, that's basically what our tech's trying to trying to achieve. <laughs> so with it now, you said it's more technology now with with what you're doing. So can you explain a bit more about what it is that you actually offer? Yeah. So um, just to to fill in that that little gap, we started to recognize through working with people running events that what it really comes down to is, is dis decisions that we make, choices that we make, you know, in every single moment of the day and whether or not we're making those, those choices from a place of awareness and alignment to the truth inside of us and integrity, or we're going against our truth, we're going against our heart. Um, and I became very fascinated with the concept of using technology to, to bring more awareness to those choices. Uh, which kind of drove the, the vision for the move into technology. Um, and that there's a lot that we want to uh, create, you know, with that tech, but in its most sort of basic version, essentially you can, you can type decisions or statements or goals into an app and use um, a multitude of different sensors, one of them being the gyroscope. Hello. Hello. Well, we've lost Nicole. Internet issues. Probably. Okay. Probably her battery went flat as well. Right. I know we're, we're keeping her late because she's in. Are she you back? Ah, oh, you're back. Um, yeah, we lost you for a moment. So you mentioned you just about, I think you said gyroscope, did you? Yeah, so the, the gyroscope in the, this is one of the sensors we use in, in our phones. It's a motion sensor. So mm -hmm. using a whipping motion like this, 
it acts as like a muscle test. So it's measuring the amount of stress or tension in the body. Um, when you're thinking about say a goal or a belief system and it will produce a, a coherent score. So it will tell you how aligned your whole human system is to that idea to basically get people to understand that, you know, just thinking something in your conscious mind or intellectualizing something isn't um, the whole story and to help people identify blocks and understand like if a decision is actually aligned to um to where they want to go in in their journey and so as we evolve it you know and it becomes more intelligent it'll really just be a tool to keep people in a state of integrity throughout their day okay but is there a wearable wearables can be integrated and will be so you know whether that be like a fitbit or an aura ring that's getting like eda signals or heart rate variability we can use that data to improve we call it a c score so a coherent score yeah. um we, we don't have uh any sort of near plans to create our own wearable just yet but that could be in the pipeline at some point yeah i was just thinking i mean if you can plug into someone else's kind of wearable device that that gives you that information particularly like when you're dreaming i want to know from the conscious to the subconscious mind and if mm -hmm. you're in a deep dream and, mm -hmm. and and you come out and you can remember it because most people don't uh, yeah and and you you could say kind of was it an, a very active dream and stuff and then you could see from the data that mm. that kind of some readings and and, and how your body was reacting to that. Did your blood pressure go up? Did your heart rate slow down or speed up? Or, I mean, what happened? Because I sometimes I wake up from a dream completely exhausted. And then I feel like I've woken up and I'm more tired than I was before I went to bed. I relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it actually like it, it should have the, this kind of utility at, over time it, because what it's basically doing is creating a, a pathway of communication between the subconscious and conscious mind. I love using, you didn't doubt it to read it. Yeah. So, so how is this going at the moment? I mean, you've got, who are your typical clients for this? So we're launching um, in, in a few weeks, which is really exciting um, with B2B. So all groups actually. So uh, our three categories are event uh, events where, where people are coming together basically to, to, facilitate transformation, um, corporations or companies and teams. So measuring their internal teams, internal alignment, to organizational goals and sporting teams who are looking to improve performance. We want to get a bunch of feedback from these um, beta test groups. And then maybe in six or so months, we'll look at doing a bigger consumer launch. Excellent. Yeah. The, the, app is, the, the app's ready now? Almost, yeah. yeah. A few um, weeks. What devices can you get it on? You'll be able to get it on any smartphone, so Android or or um, iOS. All right. Okay. Yeah. In in true. So keep yeah. keep your eye out. Yeah. And all right, it'll be available. I mean, you have to. I mean, there's a package or I'll, some. I'll, I'll let all of you guys know. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Oh, it's, you... it, it'll be it'll be subscription based, so the, right. the price point will be. Uh, don't quote me on this, but it will be around twelve or thirteen dollars a month. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's so, very interesting. In twenty twenty, we helped a guy uh, who is selling similar devices that they can measure like electro impulses, and then they can analyze them. And it's very good cool. for companies to even for team building. So because they're like games. But they also mm -hmm. measure how is your uh, psychological state, etc. So they can give some insights about what is in the brain and yeah. how to, to affect this to get also better for the company purposes, but also for the personality uh, improvement. And it was very interesting because uh, I joined such event and they asked me to play with different toys, it was different games. And yeah. it was great because it was engaging. And they, they started telling me something about me. I didn't realize even about this. So to yeah. How you make decisions, how you react on how yeah. you do on the stress. And it's, it's truly valuable. I never, because I'm a technical guy in general, 
that mm. measure something and then they can tell you something about your behavior, let's say. To... <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. I, I was just kind of, when you were talking, kind of thinking to myself, I mean, for, for kids at school, I mean, mm. you get kids coming back from school and, and they, they've either got anxiety because they're starting a new school. Mm. I mean, I watched that this yesterday, actually, because my kids are in kind of the kindergarten, go to the big school right after mm. the summer holidays. And I watched them all getting together. Then they had to go two by two. So they're finding a, a buddy to go in with. And then the, there was one little boy at the back crying his eyes out and obviously he didn't want to go in. Uh, and then my my two kids said the twins are there. So my eldest, my son, he, he's got a heart of gold. He's, he's always picking the person up off the that's fallen over, and and he's <laughs> kind of reassuring them everything is okay. Now I was just wondering, like with an app like this, I I know maybe I I, I mean maybe not for this age, but uh, at some point mm. uh, it, it'd be good to to see how people react at school because I hated the first day at school I, I hated certain lessons and there, there was lots of things that, that really gave me a lot of stress and anxiety oh. and I had I thought maybe it's just me so you kind of brush it to one side and just get on with it but mm. I had to live with that and every time I had that either that subject or that teacher or whatever it, the same thing happened again yeah uh, so I was just thinking would this be something that could be used for well, kids also? Definitely, yeah, that there's so many use cases for this. We're also looking at um, integrating with a potential partner who have created algorithms that basically can use uh, wearable data to detect mood and subsequently change things like the lighting in your environment or the music that's playing. So basically to alter your, um, your environment to make sure that you're in a state of um, calm all the time. Sometimes I want to be a rebel. <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. that's cool too, as long as, long as you're um, what, happy with that. Yeah, what, what about the other way around? Uh, if I'm feeling bloody miserable and, and doomy and gloomy, then I, I have some inspiring stuff that it, it triggers kind of, give them the inspiring stuff now. And, and here's a, a few tracks of some, upbeat music that will get me jumping yeah. up and down yeah it, it'll be seeking to to put the person into a state of um balance homeostasis basically so that their system's regulated now i i like that because sometimes the simplest thing adjustment mm. at the right time can yep. make the difference otherwise uh, th th there's a, a guy that talked about kind of a, a glass of water if it's full how long can you hold the glass of water for and then, and then, then he explains about this is what you're carrying with you. Uh, yeah. If you if you don't get rid of it or deal with it quick yeah. enough, yeah. And you don't want to be carrying that around all day because that glass of water might have didn't weigh anything at the beginning, but after eight hours holding it, is causing a huge problem. And and mm -hmm. this is the problems that we carry with us as well if we don't mm -hmm. deal with them. Definitely, yeah, it's too true. Anyway, Paul has just joined from India, right? And one hour late. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to kind of wrap this up now because I don't want to keep you any longer. And it's getting late Thanks. where you are. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, your journey has been absolutely magical. And with this recording, you can do what you want with it. I'll send you a copy of it later. And feel free to, to use it if it inspires others. I'll share it with, with the group. And if you want to network with other people that told their stories, then uh, they'll be in the group as well. And sure. I mean, from a selection of the stories, we're creating our first book as well. So, Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, so you, you can, you're welcome to join if you want to have your story in the book. Thank it'll probably, you. It'll probably take up all the book. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. That wouldn't want that. The team yeah. book, team writing, and team yeah. but, 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 but like anything, I mean, it, everything is about giving people, it kind of empowering people, help them believe in themselves, giving them some hope 
and and you're doing it through inspirational stuff like what you're doing what you've done and other other people that are on their journey feeling the same it's not doom and gloom on the end of the road it, it just means that it's a dip and you can come out of that and yeah. we are we are proof of that and particularly you i mean what you've gone through i mean both physically and mentally uh and and what you're doing for others is amazing thank you and yeah take my hat off to you i mean it's truly beautiful so so on that note i mean if you can also share any links that i can share i i i've I've copied your LinkedIn one already. What is the best way to contact you? Um, yeah, I mean, LinkedIn's good. So LinkedIn's like my name or email's fine. Um, WhatsApp or Telegram is good. Telegram is the same handle as um, Instagram, email. Is... Uh, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, everywhere. However, however you guys would like. Right, okay. So... Nicole, you've been our 87th guest and you, an Jim. absolutely a magical, wonderful guest. And I'm sorry for keeping you up so late. And no, my pleasure. I've been trying a long time to get hold of you. So it actually yeah. works. So, now it's the time. so sorry for my persistence, but I mean, we, we got there in the end. And yeah, thank you. you've shared a magical, inspiring story with us that has given me extra hope now that everything is possible thank you so, everyone thank you so thank, thank you again. very much and have yeah. a great great weekend everyone thank, thank you. you bye thank you and paul thanks for being late uh, sorry man just like i don't know some time management what like i uh,